behavior and so on it had to do with the ability to think. It's, it's, and I, as you say, there's no way to resolve it. No possible means that anyone knows to try to resolve this. Also, notice it doesn't, you know, from the point of view of origin of language, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. I mean, it comes out about the same, uh, except for timing. Uh, uh, we still have the, what seems to me the fact that the first development is uh, a, a, a perfect computational system which is linked to the conceptual interface. We first have that. Somehow, and again, this is total mystery, uh, at the atomic elements, the meaning-bearing elements, appear when, how, we have the slightest idea, uh, but they had to be there. And this is also true of some other things, like, say, for example, uh, actor-action schema, uh, notions like predication and so on. And maybe these have earlier roots, but at some point they became available and are recruited by the system. That had to happen first. Later came externalization, may, and which I think may not involve evolution. It may be just solution of a cognitive problem. Now that's consistent with at least the apparent fact that the massive diversity and complexity of language and its uh, malleability subject to change seems to lie overwhelmingly in this externalization process, uh, which makes it look like just a cognitive problem that you can solve in many different ways. Uh, that's, uh, uh, but, but the core parts of language the structures that exist in the in the mind and the semantic interpretation of them, the conceptual, the mapping to conceptual interpretation, that look could turn out that that's really fixed, that it happened once and done, no more evolution. It's a, beyond what we can establish today, but not beyond what we can imagine to be true. Uh, and then comes the question that uh, Ian Tattersall is mentioning, uh, at what point, what are the timing of these two events? Uh, the uh, uh, one of them could be at the appearance of the species, the in first one could be at the appearance of the species lying fallow for 100,000 years or so until uh, externalization takes place, along with the uh, what we see in the archaeological record, this kind of you know, great leap forward is sometimes called. Or it could be that uh, the ability to think appeared at that point. And that looks like an irresolvable question for pretty much Dick Lewontin's reasons, which I think are not taken seriously enough. So to come back to the, the, the mysterious atomic elements, uh, you said that, I mean, you said that you speculated that merge might have appeared several times, but there was nothing to work on. So are you saying that you need atomic elements for merge to work, but then could it be the case that the atomic elements are like a fuel for the system and that they are generated by the functioning of the system once it gets going? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, either is possible. I don't see how to resolve it. I mean, we know that the atomic elements are there. Uh, any computational system is gonna to have to use some atomic elements. You know, otherwise, it can't function at all. And uh, we we can ask a question whether uh, the system existed, the computational system, using computa using atomic elements that don't link to thought, and therefore were useless. And then somehow the ones that do link to thought emerge, the ones we actually have, and that kind of. Uh, you know, gave us language. That's a possibility. But now we're in the realm of the kinds of speculations that uh, fall under Lewontin's strictures. Yes. Doesn't seem to be any way to resolve it. Yes, maybe best to stay away from it. More questions? Yeah. I think Rini is raising his hand. I know. My question um, concerns uh, maybe another puzzle, um, the, the functional features. So atomic elements, the emergence of atomic elements is, um, is, is a big puzzle. The, the emergence of merge 
is a puzzle, but must be simple. But in order for the merge system to apply, and in order for um, um, the merge system to come up with, let's say, expressions that can be um, that are readable for the for the semantics, these expressions must be labeled. For labeling, you need features. So my question is. Have you any idea where the features come from, how they fit in? Because merge without, without operating on features seems a hopeless business. And second, do you have any ideas about um, constraining these features? I mean, they are very limited. Well, you're asking a question about the emergence of the features well, that the, enter the into features, yes. functional that, features. That are necessary for for, for yeah. merge to come up with uh, well-formed expressions. Let like, for example, the uh, you know, assuming that the approach is correct, the, the categorical features that determine whether a root is a noun or a verb or something, yes. or the or, 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 things like inflection and so on. Yeah, that's right, yes. N not a clue. I mean, it seems to me all in this mysterious domain. Yes. But they're very important, right? For, for Oh, they're very important. Yeah, in fact, they make the system work, yes. as your so, work has shown, in so fact. That's another, yeah. that's another puzzle. That's another that's mystery. Yeah, but I think, but notice that at the level of, I mean, this has to do with the level of kind of semantic interpretation, ultimately, and everything in that domain is a mystery. It's a mystery how any child ever learns it, because there's no evidence. For semantic interpretation, there's virtually zero evidence, even in simple cases like the ones I mentioned. And uh, the evolutionary problem is dramatic. There doesn't seem to be anything similar in uh, uh, animal communication systems. It's the discontinuity that Eric Lenneberg talked about, you know, half a century ago, seems to have been established more and more fully. Also, the kinds of discontinuity that uh, Susie Curtis talked about, the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, uh, dis the dissociation, double dissociations uh, with other cognitive capacities which is just constantly overlooked in the literature in this strange subject uh, as if you can you know somehow by magic uh, language comes out of cognitive capacities from which it's associated but i think you're right these are just complete mysteries and if luantin is correct will remain so you remember that he ends the second of his articles on this subject by saying tough luck. Okay, thanks. The next question is from uh, Stanislas Zahana. Um, hello. Um, I would like to ask you a question about the modularity or uh, encapsulation of the system you are describing. Um, I thought I understood initially by reading your, your early writings that you were talking about a system of language that had very specific properties, very specific quirks um, that made it quite unique. But hearing you today, I had a feeling that you were thinking more and more in terms of a system that was really a system of thought. Um, and I was wondering whether you think that the same system for building trees through merge um, um, also gave us at the same time in evolution the ability to develop uh, tree structures in other domains outside of the language domain such as mathematics for instance and also perhaps i didn't, I didn't catch the last phrase uh, i was i was wondering whether the system that allows us to build trees in language is the same system that allows us to build tree structures in mathematics mathematics, in mathematics. And yeah. also perhaps in the domain of action planning or tool making, which are all faculties that seem to have emerged uh, with a certain degree of convergence in human evolution. So, uh, well, on the first point, the, uh, let me stress again that the earliest work from the 1950s right through the 80s uh, did assume a very rich notion of UG, okay? And it did so for simple reasons. The, as soon as the efforts were made to construct generative grammars, immediately a huge amount of evidence emerged that nobody had any way had noticed. And uh, it was very complex and very diverse. And it seemed necessary to construct complex theories of UG to account, simply to be able to describe it. Okay. 
That's the first task. It was understood right away that that can't be right because a complex UG cannot have evolved. So the, you go back to, say, my own undergraduate thesis in the late 1940s, it's mostly concerned with simplifying phonology it was, and morphology. It was mostly concerned with that. How can we simplify it since the complexity that appears superficially necessary can't be right? If you look at uh, all the work that followed, uh, won't run through it, all of it was an attempt to reduce the complexity. Finally reached the point by the early 90s where it seemed to me at least and a number of other people that we'd reached a level of understanding where we could uh, postulate the thesis that it really is simple and work on the basis of that. Now, that's the reason for the changes. It's commonly believed, uh, many uh, commentators have claimed that this is a total shift in the uh, approach to language. It isn't. It's the single effort from the beginning to try to develop a theory of UG simple enough so that it could, so that first of all it provides deeper explanations, because that's what simplicity means, and secondly so that it could ultimately meet the condition of evolvability. Now as far as the uh, mathematics and uh, theory of action are concerned, let's begin with mathematics. I mean, as you know, it was a big problem for Darwin and Wallace that people had arithmetical capacity. As Wallace pointed out, uh, it couldn't have evolved by natural selection since the capacity was never used. And, you know, they had a famous debate about where it came from. And it is a problem. The, the only plausible uh, account of this, of, of the evolution of our, it's basically arithmetical competence. You know, the rest of mathematics is different. Uh, how could this have evolved? It's possible, and it's an old idea, that it is an offshoot of language. And in, in fact, you can uh, get a model of arithmetic from merge, simply from merge, if you restrict the lexicon to a single element. That gives a model for arithmetic. There's a counter argument to this famous one of the dissociations. So, you know, there's dissociations between arithmetical and linguistic competence. But that doesn't necessarily show anything, as Luigi Rizzi pointed out years ago, because what you're testing always is performance. And it could be that the systems are identical, but that the ability to use them involves separate systems, yielding the dissociation, although at the core uh, the systems are the same. I mean, Rizzi gave the analogy of uh, speech and reading. They're dissociated, but nobody thinks there's an independent uh, reading module in the brain. It's the same system, but the way it's executed uh, involves different systems. This is the crucial distinction between competence and performance that is often overlooked, but is very crucial. So that could be the answer for arithmetic. Uh, as far as theory of action is concerned, my own feeling is that the literature on this is pretty confused, and for reasons that Andrea Moro has pointed out. I mean, it's true that there are, you know, action does involve hierarchical structures, but they're nothing like language, absolutely nothing. Like you don't have dependencies. Uh, the reason, for example, this goes back to the 50s, why uh, finite automata, Markovian sources, uh, can't work for language, as had been generally assumed to be the case at the time, is because of dependencies. You know, if then, either or, you know, that sort of thing, men are, and so on, which can be arbitrarily remote and can be embedded. Uh, in uh, usage. There's a ton of misunderstanding about this in the literature. I mean, it was shown 50 years ago, George Miller and I showed, that uh, you, a person, uh, we can relatively easy, easily understand nested dependencies up to short-term memory, roughly seven. Uh, of course, we don't use them because they're too complicated. And many researchers, the founders of connectionism, many others, 
have said, well, we don't use them beyond two, so they don't exist. That's total misunderstanding. We don't use them because they're complex, but we can understand them. It's kind of like saying uh, our arithmetical competence doesn't exist because we can't multiply big numbers in our head. Total misunderstanding. The capacities in your head, it's a kind of a Turing machine system. You have the capacity, you have external memory, and it goes on indefinitely. And as we know, a simple perception without external memory, it goes up to about seven, uh, which is the limit of short-term memory, exactly what you expect. Uh, but now turning to action, you just don't have those dependencies. I mean, it looks superficially as if you do. Like, for example, I can, you know, walk into the kitchen, uh, make a sandwich, uh, walk out of the kitchen, and it looks as if walk into a kitchen and walk out of the kitchen are a dependency, but they're not. I can just as well walk into the kitchen. Uh, uh, eat a sandwich and uh, spend the rest of my life there. That's possible too. There's no dependency. Uh, and I think that runs right through the theory of action. Yeah, there's hierarchical structure, but nothing remotely like what you see in language. So I think that the, these analogies just don't mean anything. Arithmetic is a different story. That has a definite structure. And we do have to ask, I mean, your work is crucial in this respect, how the uh, these structures evolved, even though they were never used. Wallace's question. And a possibility is offshoot of language. Can I, can I make a short response to that? I think you may be right that it's not always needed to describe actions in terms of a nested structure, but I think this may be the way in which we interpret it nevertheless. So uh, we may have the capacity to project on somebody else's action a nested structure just because we have this representational capacity. So that's that's one small reflection. I, I do think that we think of action as being hierarchically organized, whether it is the correct description or not. That's, that's how humans think about it. And um, the second statement I like to, is just a hypothesis that I am considering very seriously in my work at the brain level to try to understand what was unique, what changed in the human brain. Um, one possibility that I would consider very seriously is that there are many parallel loops in the brain, for instance, loops linking the basal ganglia with the cortex. And that it's, it could be that some parameter of these loops changed simultaneously for all of these loops, that some of them are involved in language, some of them are involved in mathematics, some of them are involved in action, such that the human brain would have been endowed with the ability to create three structures in these different domains, and yet they would remain dissociable because there is not a single brain structure which is able to uh, create three structures, but there is in fact a duplication of multiple systems that are all able to create three structures. So I don't know if this hypothesis makes sense to you no. or resonates with your thinking. Well, on the first point, I agree. We do interpret what people are doing in terms of nested structures, but that's our interpretation. And that interpretation probably comes from the fact that we're interpreting them in language, which does have nested structures. So what we see, we tend to impose an interpretation uh, based on our own systems. But that doesn't mean that that's the way they're organized. Uh, so that's why I think that uh, the analogies that are drawn actually in the literature, again, Andrea, who's over there, has written critically of this in Friends in Cognitive Science quite accurately, I think. Uh, these things are just our misinterpretation of what's actually happening, a misinterpretation that's natural from uh, the point of view of how we describe things. Uh, on the second point, uh, you know, there, are th there are three things that you're connecting here, language, mathematics, and action. It seems to me that action is entirely different from the first two. It just has completely different properties. Like, for example, it doesn't have uh, structured the structural properties of mathematics or the nesting properties of language and so on. It just doesn't have them. 
Uh, mathematics and language are, is an interesting question. And really, it's not mathematics, it's arithmetic. The rest of mathematics you know, is, is a different matter. You remember Kronecker's famous statement that uh, God created arithmetic and man created the rest. Uh, I think a way of interpreting that is that uh, uh, evolution of humans created arithmetic and our cognitive capacities then created the rest. Of course, they're constrained by you know, our genetic capacity, but that's a different matter. Uh, with regard to arithmetic, uh, I, I don't see how, it, how what your hypothesis is different from the one that suggests that uh, arithmetic is simply language restricted to a lexicon with a single element. And of course, with no interfaces. That seems to me essentially the same thing. Yeah. The next question is from Peter Hagward. Uh, at meetings like this on the evolution of language, we also see cross-species comparison. So for instance, we hear about birdsong or about the capacities of other species to handle sequences and so on. Uh, likewise, we see cross-species comparisons in terms of the infrastructure of the brain. Do you see any usage, usefulness of these cross-species comparisons for understanding the evolution of language? And if so, what is its usefulness? Well, with, a bird song is is very interesting case and has a lot of interesting properties. But the uh, similarities that you're pointing to have to do with externalization. So forming a, you know, a bird song has a sequence of, you know, chirps and they go in a particular order and they're arranged in a certain way and so on. That's similar to, you know, whether it's analogous to it, that's another question, but it at least has some similarity to externalization of language. I don't see any similarity to the internal structure of language, the kind that I've been discussing. There are Similar, some similarities at the level of externalization. And that's not too surprising because there just aren't a lot of ways to externalize things. You know, if you look at the apparatus, the sensory apparatus for externalization, it is pretty well restricted to putting things in order, you know, strings on a bead, kind of. doesn't have a lot of alternatives. You know, you can't speak in parallel, birds can't either. Uh, you can't produce structures. Uh, the, the sensory apparatus doesn't lo doesn't allow it. So there aren't going to be a lot of ways for externalization to take place. Now, how much, you know, if, if what I suggested is correct, uh, the externalization properties of language are peripheral to it, and in fact might not involve uh, evolutionary processes. If that's correct, then there wouldn't be any interesting connection to, uh, say, Birdsong. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Rini? Yeah. You have uh, often um, stated that um, it's hard to imagine how a recursive system could have evolved gradually. Now, that's an important statement, it seems to me, but the statement hasn't been picked up in... Um, uh, in the evolution of language studies, it seems to me. Could you elaborate a bit on why it is h hard to imagine um, a gradual ev evolutionary story for, 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 for a recursive system for merge? For, for, well, we have to be careful for an infinite digital recursive yeah. system. Yeah. yeah. Well, there just is no way to reach infinity in small steps. I mean, take, say, arithmetic, which is uncontentious. I don't think language should be contentious, but it is. Arithmetic is uncontentious. Uh, every child, every normal child, has the understand, comprehends at some age that the numbers can go on forever. Okay? Uh, no other animal does. Now, that capacity can't develop step by step. I mean, you can get to 2, then 7, then 83. At some point, you have to say, oh, it goes on forever. And you might as well have that at the first step. Nothing is gained by imagining the intermediate steps. Uh, this is uh, 
this enters into the discussion of proto-language, like the early proposals about proto-language were that, you know, like it had short sentences and then it developed into language. Well, that can't be. If you take a look at Derek Bickerton's recent book, his latest one that just came out, he uh, very angry about this. He says it's a canard to say that uh, proto-language only had short sentences. He said it could have indefinitely long sentences. Okay, where'd they come from? How did you get the operation that gave you indefinitely long sentences, each of which has an inter each part of which has an interpretation? Take a look at his explanation. It turns out to be magic. You know, and it's it's going to be like that. You you can't build up to develop an, a, a, a digitally infinite system by small steps, just as a matter of logic. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Willem Zuidema. Oh, thanks. I, so I have the opportunity to ask my second question. So um, my second question is about focal learning. Uh, so I think m many people in the, in the field of evolution of language are sort of uh, converging of, on, on this idea that, that focal auditory learning is, is one very important prerequisite for language and music. Uh, and something that fortunately is shared with a couple of other species. So that, that might actually help us to, to build up and constrain evolutionary scenarios. So is there any, any way that you're, uh, that you're, what's your take basically on it? I guess that's my question. Uh, I, I didn't catch the first, were you saying verbal learning? No, folk, voc, vocal learning. So vocal imitation, kind of? vocal, vocal imitation learning. Vocal imitation. Well, um, it's, you know, it's possible, but I think a question is, uh, how come sign is just as usable as, and develops exactly the same way? I mean, it's, it's true that the articulatory auditory modality has some advantages, like you can talk to each other in the dark, for example. Uh, but uh, a sign, we now know, it wasn't known 50 years ago, but it's by now pretty well known that the uh, acquisition and use and structure of sign and probably even its neural representation is essentially the same as spoken language. So that doesn't seem to have anything to do with, uh, uh, you know, with uh, a, a, a verbal imitation. You can have sign imitation. In fact, why didn't, I mean, apes can sign perfectly well. Why don't they develop sign language the way human infants do spontaneously, uh, even without external uh, you know, by now there are cases known, many of you know, of uh, sign languages that have been developed by children simply by interaction with each other, no external inputs. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'm just looking around whether there are any more questions remaining. Yes, Ian Roberts would like to. Thanks. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, uh, I have... Uh, uh, a question actually concerning, again, uh, the externalization systems. Uh, because from what we know uh, from f the study of phonology, there are a number of similarities with, uh, with the, the core system in the sense that it's a digital computational system. There's evidence for cyclic rule application of various kinds, particularly in uh, metrical phonology. Um, and also, of course, we know that sign language shows phonological properties as well, which are very similar to, to the other modality. Uh, so. Uh, I was wondering, to what extent do you think that these properties stem from the core system? Or is it, are these just accidental superficial relationships? Or is there maybe some overarching reason why the systems are, in certain respects, similar? Yeah, I, there are several possible answers, actually. As you know, my own work and work with Mars Halley and others on cyclic rules uh, uh, actually tried to unify the uh, syntactic and uh, phonological systems back from the 1950s. And the, uh, Andrew Nevins' work, uh, you know, on, uh, uh, it, it illustrates another kind of, uh, uh, of connection between which agreement systems in 
uh, syntax and morphology and uh, uh, harmony and uh, vowel harmony and so on, spoken language, and there's plenty of similarities. So what could they mean? Well, if you, if you, if you accept the speculation that I've been presenting, what they could mean is that when the task of externalization was undertaken, it made use of the properties of language that were already there and applied them to this new task. That's one possibility. Another possibility, which is perfectly conceivable, is that there's some deeper reason, you know, in neural structure, cognitive structure, why this kind of operation should take place, let's say cyclicity or you know, harmony or something. And uh, at the moment, I don't see how we can choose between uh, hypotheses like these, but they're real ones. Maybe there are ways to look into them. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, just one look, last look into the audience. There's a question at the back. Maybe you can come forward a bit so you can see you. Thank you. Uh, my question uh, goes back to the discussion of computational efficiency because it's uh, a notion that you use several times in your talk and it's also been discussed in the previous days in the previous presentations and in, in this colloquium. And it seems that uh, there's there's not a uniform consensus on what uh, computational efficiency actually is. So you had the example with um, which book will he read? And you said that there's a high computational load in uh, maintaining the lower copy of which book. Uh, I assume that's uh, not really within narrow syntax, but more at the sensory motor interface. Um, but but would it, for instance, actually be more useful, say, for the uh, for the conceptual intentional uh, interface that the that the lower copy of which book actually remain and and overarchingly do we do we really have an, an objective benchmark for what is computationally efficient and what isn't well I think it is the narrow question uh, is it more efficient for the conceptual and conceptual intentional interface to have both pronounced uh, the answer is yes because that gives the interpretation we don't get the right interpretation otherwise now that's why you have these very elaborate systems of uh, trying to determine the interpretation of sentences in uh, approaches that uh, bar uh, transformational rules or displacement rules. You can kind of build up something that will give you the interpretations, but it's extremely complex. And it's given directly to, in a rich variety of cases if you simply assume things work in the simplest possible way. So I think that's, that part is pretty straight. On the nature of computational efficiency, you're perfectly right. It's not a, a priori, completely clear notion by any means. However, the cases that are involved in the discussions of the kind I've had and in the literature use notions of elementary, of computational efficiency so elementary that any future development of our understanding of the notion will certainly accommodate them. Like the, the idea that less is better than more. Okay. That fewer computations are better than more computations. That uh, minimal search is better than long search. You know, as long as you keep the notions that simple, you can be pretty confident that any future understanding of the notion of computational efficiency it will accommodate these results. I mean, conceivably, it will turn out otherwise, but it doesn't look very plausible. Uh, furthermore, you know, the notion of computational efficiency that will be developed maybe someday for biology will not be necessarily an a priori notion, like uh, quantum physics might use a different notion. Uh, there are going to be constraints coming from the systems that are discussed as to what counts as efficiency within those systems. That's to be expected. Another way of putting it is that our understanding of computational efficiency, the concept itself, will develop 
as we proceed in explaining facts about the phenomena of the biological phenomena. I'll give you a concrete example. A work of about my own work and others about, say, 15 years ago, uh, assumed that the length of derivations was a factor in computational complexity. It looks now as if it probably isn't. Okay. Well, that's a move towards an understanding of the way computational efficiency either could be true, the way computational efficiency in fact works in the biological system language, and may, uh, whether how much this extends to biology generally is pretty unclear. One reason is that in the biological world, it is very hard to find examples of digital infinity. I mean, you just don't find many such examples. So take, say, animal communication. Uh, vervet monkey, let's say, has whatever it is, half a dozen calls. It's finite. Uh, take, say, uh, uh, the waggle dance, you know, bee communication. It's basically a continuous system, not a digital system, uh, insofar as a physical system can be continuous. Uh, it's, uh, and you don't seem to find anything in between. There are continuous systems, there are finite systems, but uh, try to find a digitally infinite system. It's very difficult. Maybe there aren't any beyond the level of maybe DNA. Uh, in, in that case, uh, language would be extremely unusual biological system with just no counterparts. And that looks pretty much like it's the case. If so, then the, the uh, concept of computational, computational efficiency in language may not generalize easily to other biological systems because language is so unique in this formal respect. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks to all the questioners. Uh, we've reached more or less the end of this session. Thank you very much, Noam. Uh, of course, it's, very, it's a great pity that you couldn't be here with us today, but this is the next best thing. So we thank you very much for your effort of going to the studio and talking to us today. Thanks very much, thank and bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.